How do you analyze acceptance on a contract's essay question? Well, remember, to form a traditional enforceable contract, there's going to be three requirements. Offer, acceptance, and consideration. And remember, in our last two videos, we've been discussing the offer, how a person goes about forming an offer, and once we have a valid offer, how that offer can be terminated before acceptance. So at this part of the analysis, if we've established that we have a valid offer, and that offer is still alive, it hasn't been terminated for any of the reasons we discussed in our last video, the next question is going to be how the offeree goes about validly accepting that offer, okay? So in this video, we wanna focus on the acceptance and how a person goes about accepting a valid offer that is alive and hasn't been terminated. For now, let's just focus on these first three requirements. I have up here written five things that I wanna talk about in this video. Actually, this fifth one we're gonna save for the next video, but I wanna preview it in this video. But for terms of determining whether or not we have a valid acceptance, I like to think about it in terms of three elements and two considerations, right? Two issues to keep in the back of your mind as we're working through these elements. But let's start with one, two, and three, how we go about accepting an offer, okay? So number one, similar to the offer, the acceptance is going to be governed by an objective test. So the offeree, in order to accept the offer, must manifest an objective willingness to enter into the agreement. So here, remember that outward actions and appearances are going to be determinative, not subjective hidden intentions. So if you offer to sell me your dry erase marker for $5 and I say I accept, but my fingers are crossed behind my back, do we have an acceptance? Similar to the offer, of course, right? My outward actions are determinative, not my subjective hidden intention. So if I have some secret intent to not accept your offer, but I'm manifesting what appears to be an objective, an objective willingness to enter the agreement, then we're going to have acceptance. It doesn't matter what I subjectively intend in my own brain, it's just what a reasonable person would interpret to be willingness to enter the agreement, right? So number one, to accept, the offeree must manifest an objective willingness to enter into the agreement. Number two, the offeree must accept the offer in accordance with the rules established by the offeror who is master of the offer. So what's unique here in the acceptance, which we kind of didn't touch on in our offer analysis, is that the offeror is the master of the offer. This is a term of art. And what it means is the offeree has to accept the offer in accordance with whatever rules are established by the offeror. Okay, so if I say to you, I offer to sell you my dry erase marker for $5, and if you want to accept this offer to have my dry erase marker for $5, I'm asking you to do three backflips and then tell me that you accept. And let's say you just say, I accept. Have you accepted my offer to purchase this marker for $5? No, I am master of the offer. So if I say to accept, you have to do three backflips in order to accept, you can't simply say, I accept and conclude the deal, right? You're going to have to actually do three backflips to accept my offer. I am master of the offer. I can require you to do anything. now. Most commonly, what you're going to see an offeror do is require a signed writing. So imagine I could say, I offer to sell you my dry erase marker for $5. If you want to accept, send me a signed letter in the next three days, you know, expressing your intent to purchase, right? So to accept, if you simply then say, okay, deal, I accept, that's not a valid acceptance. I'm saying you have to send me a letter, a signed writing in the next three days. You have to follow whatever rules I establish, no matter how wacky they seem or whatever. I mean, granted, nothing illegal, right? Obviously, that's not going to work or, you know, but within reason, of course, right? Anything that the master of the offer is establishing as rules that you have to abide by to accept, 
you're generally going to have to follow those rules in order to accept validly, right? And so what we really want to think about here too is the difference between bilateral contracts and unilateral contracts. And we touched on this in our last video, right? But a bilateral contract is a contract that is asking for acceptance, where the offeror is asking for acceptance in the form of a return promise. So this would be, I offer to sell you my dry erase marker for $5 and you say, I accept, right? That is a bilateral contract. I'm offering to sell you my marker for $5 if you pay me $5, but I'm not asking for you to hand me the $5 immediately to accept. I'm asking for a return promise that you're going to pay me $5, right? On the flip side, a unilateral contract is where the offeror is asking for acceptance in the forms, uh, in the form of action or performance. So the classic example here are contest offers and reward offers, but it doesn't even have to be that. Imagine that I, my cat is missing. We can stick with this example. Say I have a missing cat and I say to you, if you go out there and you find my cat and return my cat to me safely, I will pay you $100. And you say, I accept. Have you accepted that offer? No. That's a unilateral contract. As master of the offer, I'm asking for acceptance in the form of action or performance. Once you go out, find my cat, and return it to me, then you've accepted my offer, right? But I'm asking for a performance or action of you going out and finding my cat and returning it to me. I'm not asking for a return promise that you're going to do it. I'm saying if you go out and do X, Y, and Z, if you go out and find my cat and return it to me safely, I will then pay you, right? So I'm asking for action or performance. So that's going to be a unilateral contract. Okay. So the key here with a unilateral contract is going to be that once performance on a unilateral contract starts, the offer becomes irrevocable. Remember we talked about this in the last video. If I offer to you that I'm going to pay you $100 if you return my cat to me, if you go out and hire a search team to go looking for the cat, once you start performance, that offer becomes irrevocable. I can't call you and say, hey, I revoke my offer, you know, whatever, right? If you've started performance on a unilateral contract, you've gone out, you've hired a search team, you're out there looking for the cat, I can't call you up and revoke that offer. But that doesn't mean you've accepted my offer. Mere starting or mere beginning performance isn't acceptance. Acceptance is only going to be valid when you complete for performance. So acceptance on a unilateral contract is going to be valid upon completion. So once you return the cat to me, you've completed performance, that is going to be your acceptance. Now compare that to a bilateral contract or a bilateral offer. Once performance is started on a bilateral contract, that is going to manifest acceptance. So if we have a bilateral contract where I'm just asking for a return promise, you can either accept by giving me that return promise or starting performance. Once you start performance, that's going to be considered a manifestation of acceptance under a bilateral contract. So here, just remember for bilateral, it's going to be, you know, starting performance starting performance and that's a very important distinction to make unilateral contract once you start performance the offer becomes irrevocable but it's not a valid acceptance until performance is completed bilateral contract you can either accept by giving me a return promise or by beginning performance once you begin performance that's going to manifest a valid acceptance okay so big difference there, that's the master of the offer and kind of the difference between bilateral contracts and unilateral contracts. The third thing that we have to remember here in terms of the acceptance, remember an element to the formation of an offer. Remember we said that the offeror had to create a power of acceptance in the offeree. 
So here, similar to this idea, in order to accept, the offeree must be the person that the power of acceptance was created in. You must have the power to accept, the power of acceptance to accept the offer, right? And remember, I briefly illustrated this example, but just to rehash it, imagine that I offer to sell you my dry erase marker for $5. And let's say there's a window cleaner standing outside here cleaning the window and he hears this offer being made. He hears me saying to you, I offer to sell you my dry erase marker for $5. Right, and let's say that the window guy behind me hears this and he says, oh, I accept, Michael, I'm over here, I accept. Well, he's manifested an object of willingness to enter into the agreement. He's accepting according to the terms that I've established as master of the offer. So he's established two elements, but the reason that that's not going to work is because I have not conferred to him a power of acceptance. I created a power of acceptance in you when I made the offer. He does not have the power to accept. So remember, it has to be specifically directed at a person under the power of acceptance. Remember in our last video, in our first video on the offer, we said in order to form a valid offer, the offeror must create a power of acceptance in the offeree. If you do not hold that power of acceptance, you cannot accept. In that instance, the window guy cleaning my window would not be the holder of the power of acceptance. You would. So that would not be a valid acceptance from the window guy. Okay? The obvious exception here, or just one other thing to think about, is contests and reward offers. Remember, if you go out there, if I went outside and posted a bunch of signs saying my cat's missing, if anyone finds it and returns it to me, I'm gonna pay them $100. Let's say that a person who's never seen any of these flyers or signs finds my cat and somehow returns it to me. In order for it to be an acceptance, the person returning, completing the performance in the contest or reward offer has to be aware that the contest or reward offer existed. Just a little nuance to know in your head, it's often tested, especially on the multiple choice portion of contracts, but in order to accept um, for a contest or reward offer, you have to be aware that the contest or reward offer existed, okay? So that's your three elements for acceptance of an offer. You have to manifest an object of willingness to enter the agreement. The offeree must accept in accordance with the rules established by the offeror, who is master of the offer, and the offeree has to hold the power of acceptance. Those are generally going to be what I like to call the three elements that are needed to accept. Um, you might see that in a little bit of different ways, but that's generally the way I teach. And now, of course, there's going to be some, uh, some other issues here that we have to focus on. And I'll just go ahead and say right now that the mirror image rule in UCC 2207 uh, this fifth thing that I have written right here, we're going to have to talk about in a whole separate video because that's a very, very extensive analysis that's going to require its own video. But for now, let's just focus on the mailbox rule. So the mailbox rule is a, is a timing issue, right? So, and by the way, I see the mailbox rule. It's one of these ideas in the law that I see law students bungle all the time. And I'm not exactly sure why, because it's not a complicated rule, but somehow I think students think they understand it and then they go to apply it and things get bungled. So now would be the time to really pay close attention and I'm gonna try to do this very slowly. But all the mailbox rule is, all that it says is that an acceptance sent in the mail, via letter, postage, stamped envelope, if you're sending a letter in the mail as an acceptance, that acceptance is valid the moment that you drop it into the mailbox. The moment that that thing, that letter leaves your hands and it goes into the post box, that outgoing mailbox, that acceptance is now valid, okay? And there's only two ways two ways, generally only two ways, that that would not apply. Number one, if you're dealing with an irrevocable offer. Okay, so an option contract firm offer, we talked about that in our previous videos. 
If you're dealing, if the offer that's being accepted is irrevocable, the mailbox rule does not apply. The only other reason that the mailbox rule would not apply is if the offeree is sending a termination letter before he is sending his acceptance letter. Okay? So if I send, if I'm the offeree, or let's stick with our, with our original example. Let's say I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5 and you want to mail me an acceptance letter. The second that you write your acceptance letter that you say, I accept the terms of your deal, Michael, and you stamp it and you get the right address on that envelope and you put it in the mailbox, it's accepted. My offer has been accepted. So if I call you an hour after you've dropped that letter in the mailbox and I say, hey, I'm revoking my offer, it's already been accepted. I can now not revoke my offer. Even though I haven't received your acceptance letter, it hasn't even reached me yet. I have no idea. The second that you dropped it in the mailbox, it was an acceptance. So anything that happens after that point is irrelevant, okay? The second that that goes in there, unless the offer was irrevocable, which it's not, if I just say, I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5, there's nothing in that that makes that offer irrevocable. Okay, so the moment that it goes in, that acceptance letter is dropped in the mailbox, it's a valid acceptance. Now, what if you, the offeree, put something else in the mailbox first? You put in a termination letter, either a counter offer or a rejection. Let's say that first thing you write to me is a rejection letter. So I offer to sell you my dry erase marker for $5. You write a letter saying, thank you for the offer, Michael, but I have to reject. I don't want to take up that deal. No, thank you. Rejection. And you drop that in the mailbox and then you go home. And then you think about it and you're like, man, I wish I accepted it. So then you go back, you write an acceptance letter and then you put that in the mail. In that situation, if you're sending a termination letter first, either a counter offer or rejection, then the mailbox rule does not apply. And in that situation, it's going to be whatever letter I receive first is going to control. So in our timeline, if you send me a, so I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5, you write me first a rejection letter. You put that in the mail rejection letter is sent is in the mail and then an hour later you send an acceptance letter acceptance letter this the mailbox rule does not apply because you sent a termination letter first this, so whichever one of these two i receive first is going to control if i get if i open my mailbox a week later and i happen to open the rejection letter first then the offer is rejected, okay? If I happen to open the acceptance letter first, then the acceptance is going to control, then the offer is accepted, okay? But if we switch these two things, if we were to switch them on our timeline, if you sent me the acceptance first, then nothing else matters from that point forward because the mailbox rule controls. The acceptance is in the mail. The second that you put that acceptance letter in the mail, then the offer is accepted. So it doesn't matter what happens after that, whether I call you and try to revoke, or you call me and try to revoke, or you send more letters in the mail, or I send more letters in the mail, it doesn't matter because it's not an irrevocable offer and nothing was sent, a termination letter was not sent first. So the mailbox rule controls. So the moment that that goes in the mail, we have an acceptance of the offer. Nothing else that happens after is going to change that. Do not get confused. This is very simple, very simple. Think about the timeline. If a termination letter is sent before the acceptance, mailbox rule doesn't apply. If it's sent after the acceptance, mailbox rule does apply. If it's sent before and the mailbox rule does not apply, then it's just whatever the offeror opens first is going to control, okay? So it isn't that difficult, but sometimes I guess when you have a lot happening in the fact pattern, you're under a timer, it can be confusing. Now, 
Okay, of course, too, one other big note to make about the mailbox rule is it does not apply to any other form of communication. It only applies to acceptances, acceptance letters. So if you send a rejection letter, a revocation letter, a counteroffer letter, none of those are going to be valid when they're dropped in the mailbox. Those are gonna be valid upon receipt, when the person that it's being sent to opens that letter and reads it. That is when the anything else other than an acceptance letter that is sent is going to be valid. So don't get confused. The mailbox rule only applies to acceptance letters that are sent in the mail. That's why if a rejection letter is sent before the acceptance letter, it doesn't, we don't say that that rejection is valid when you drop it in. We say whichever one the guy opens first controls because the mailbox rule only applies to acceptance letters. Hey guys, sorry about that. My camera cut off and my voice is getting hoarse, which usually means that it's time to wrap this thing up. All that I was trying to get at is for the mailbox rule. And that last point I was making before the camera cut off is that the key with the two exceptions. So when I say that the mailbox rule applies unless the offer is irrevocable or unless a termination letter is sent first, what I really mean to say is if the offeree sends a termination letter first, then the mailbox rule does not control. If the offeror sends a termination letter first, the mailbox rule still does control. So for example, if I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5, I'm the offeror, I offer to sell this dry erase marker to you for $5. And then an hour later, I put a revocation letter in the mail, a termination letter in the mail. That does not make the mailbox rule inapplicable. Me doing that doesn't matter. If you, before you receive that revocation letter, if you put an acceptance letter in the mail, the second you drop that acceptance letter in the mail, you've accepted my offer as long as you haven't received my revocation letter, okay? The key is, would be if the offeree sends a termination letter first, then the mailbox rule does not apply. So if I offer to sell you my dry erase marker for $5, and then I don't send anything else in the mail, and you send a termination letter first, you send a rejection letter, then that's going to kill the mailbox rule. Now that exception applies and the mailbox rule is out. It's going to be whichever one I receive first. So the key is, if the offeree sends a termination letter before the acceptance letter, then the mailbox rule does not apply, and whichever letter I open first, or whichever letter the offeror opens first, is going to control. If that offeror happens to open the rejection letter first, offer is terminated. If that offeror happens to open the acceptance letter first, the offer is accepted. Okay, hopefully all of that makes sense with the mailbox rule. In our next video, there's going to be one more gigantic issue we have to talk about to cover acceptance fully, and that's going to be the mirror image rule versus the UCC. And this is going to deal with an issue when the offeree adds additional terms to the deal. Does that constitute a counter offer or an acceptance? And we're going to find that the common law and the UCC treat this issue a little bit different in different circumstances. So we're gonna explore that question in our next video. But until then guys, I wish you all the absolute best. Hope this video was helpful and I'll see you at our next video.